Welcome, and thank you very much for joining this exhibition from wherever you find yourself in the world. The Leaving Home exhibition by Professor Mary Duca is in fact a section in four parts. We have the privilege of hearing directly from the artist, taking us through the exhibition and sharing some insights into the thinking and what we see in this exhibition currently. We are also very honored to hear from three of Professor Duca's colleagues, Professor Pam Maseko, the Executive Dean for the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Peter Bensbergen, and Professor Bruce Cadle, both from the School of Visual and Performing Arts. The Nelson Mandela University stands proud to welcome you all to this online exhibition, Living Home, by Professor Mary Duca. The exhibition demonstrates the ability of transdisciplinary work across mediums in the visual and performing arts. This example of agility is the essence towards the revitalization of humanities disciplines needed globally now more than ever before. As a faculty of humanities um, at Mandela, we have adopted this as our academic project. It is therefore in pursuit of engaging new scholarship and themes of innovation and creativity that should engender more voices to be heard. What better way to make use of art to see the unheard and hear the silences? This online exhibition marks the culmination of a body of work that has interrogated the concept of home, place, and ruin. Professor Mary Duca has created an exhibition that allows us to travel into the deeper thinking of what home has meant, what it means, and what it could mean. According to Deleuze and Gattari, art begins not with flesh, but with the house. And this insulation offers us to look deeper. This work calls for a response in all of us, and in particular to artists in the academy and beyond, to reflect in methods of truth telling through creative methodologies known and to be discovered. We see this exhibition as a golden highlight on our institutional calendar, allowing all of us, the Mandela University family, to congratulate Professor Mary Duca, the scholar, and Mary Duca, the artist. Leaving Home is a structured and a series of visual chapters comprised of images, videos, and assemblages that have been collected uh, over a period of time. It is the end product of a long period of time spent exploring the ruins of abandoned homes in the Eastern Cape. For Mary Duca's research process leading up to the exhibition, it provided a way for her to think about the complexities of the word we call home and the place we call home, and what it means, especially to women in all their different sets, various sets and circumstances. Ruined homesteads tell a multiplicity of stories, stories of quiet violence, of aspirations and expectations, of, of oppression and entrapment, of vulnerability, and it includes stories that conjure up spectres of racism and patriarchy regarding the wicked histories of the Eastern Cape. The exhibition itself is an expression of the artist's ambivalence towards the very concept and the word that we call home, especially in the way that she was raised and understands that con concept. According to Mary, home seems to be an elusive spectra within itself. It's a great honor for me to be able to preside at this opening of Mary Duca's Leaving Home exhibition. Um, it's certainly a significant and auspicious event. Um, it's given me pause to contemplate the past 40 years. I met Mary in 1981 when I was a first year student in art history, um, intent on making a mark as an aspiring graphic designer. And I was just a little full of myself as someone who figured he had enough worldliness under his belt to mess with this young, forcefully focused lecturer. She, of course, was having none of that and neatly swatted me down like a fly when I challenged her modus operandi. So it's ironic that we became colleagues, me in graphic design and she in fashion and textiles, and we both shifted hither and thither through various iterations of the art school and its department over the years, um, into management, out of management, locking horns, becoming allies in a particular order. 
It has been a fascinating and fulfilling journey, Mary, and I'm really proud to have worked with you all of these many years. And that brings me to the actual exhibition. I pay tribute to you as a respected lecturer, a leader, a colleague, and an artist of repute for what stands before us today. I see a labor of magnanimity of purpose, intensity, meticulous order, and sense made of that which is almost phantom-like, impossible to constrain, and that in its melancholy evokes in me a strange nostalgia and sadness. It compels one to be silent and to contemplate the spaces in between, the absences of presence and the missing conversations I hear resonating in my own head. As I said to you when I first saw this exhibition, hung some few days back, it is mesmerizing and otherworldly. Lastly, it is thanks to Mary that this gallery exists at Nelson Mandela University, another labor of love and evidence of her never let go maxim. This remarkable space, um, transformed and remodeled so as to allow the colonial history to coexist with expectant futures, allows the visual arts a space of connection and exchange with the Kreberga community and beyond. Your imprint on Nelson Mandela University's future history is appreciated, Mary, and I congratulate you on your remarkable achievement with this grand show. Thank you. The images and videos and the spectral fragments and objects that the homemakers left behind them have been installed as an assemblage that relates to the spaces in the Bird Street Gallery. I have a long and positive curatorial connection with these spaces, so it's been fulfilling beyond my dreams to install my own work in them. I also have a long and positive and productive collegial connection with the gallery team, the visual arts department, and the university's art, culture, and heritage teams, and I thank them for their support in this endeavor. But at this moment, as I pace the floors in the gallery, I feel some, somewhat anxious about welcoming you as my virtual guests. It is strange and unnerving to think that this exhibition, which is so very focused on tactility, which is the material evidence of an extended practice-based research process, which is the product of solitary time spent in the brokenness of the damp, scorched, crumbling ruins of abandoned homes, of time spent digging in the dirt, breathing in the acrid smells of the past, will at this plagued and disconcerting moment of history be shared with you as an unseen audience on a dematerialized virtual platform. If you read the signs, if you listen and look with all your senses, ruined homes tell you a multiplicity of stories, stories of quiet violence, of aspirations and entrapments, stories that conjure up the specters of racism and patriarchy, of complicity in the wicked histories of the Eastern Cape. Revelations of the desires that women are still raised to aspire to, the desire to create the perfect home, to be the perfect housewife, of compulsions to bleach and polish and clean away dirt, to create a home that is filled with impressive possessions, that is a safe haven, that is permanent, and that is the perfect place. So I became caught up in a fascination with ruined homes and what they mean, and the stories they could tell if they could speak and the secrets they might choose not to tell. And the work which is presented here is an autoethnographic creative response to those wordless stories. There are four distinct and yet intertwined chapters, each located in a separate room and comprising of a series of assemblage installations of found objects, video projections, and hand-tinted bleached postcards from the edge. In chapter one, which is entitled The Afterlife of Desire, the work is located in the grand reception room of the house in which the gallery is located. In the center of the room, there is an installation of bleached, shredded, damaged shoes uh, entitled, If the Shoe Fits, Wear It. Um, this refers and references the multiple identities and roles that the woman of the house needs to assume. 
the creative arts provide a powerful means to express the gendered experience of being in the home. In her poetry, Emily Dickinson asks what it means to be homeless at home. In A Room of One's Own, Virginia Woolf muses, I thought how unpleasant it is to be locked out. And then I thought how it is worse perhaps to be locked in. If you search on the online lyric sites, you will find thousands of references to home. You will find ambivalence. Phrases like, there is no place like home and home sweet home. Lyrics that speak of nostalgia and homesickness, along with those that speak their truths about gender-based violence and the tension and trauma about the world behind closed doors, behind frosted glass windows. So chapter two is entitled The Unwritten Archive of Quiet Violence. And that focuses attention on the undocumented, the silenced and the erased histories of women within the home. The home in all its constructions and its manifestations. The research process leading up to the exhibition provided a way to think about the complexities of what home means. Home is an ever elusive imaginary. Home is a site of unhomeliness. Home is a site of fear, of desire, of contentment. It's been a way to reflect on what it means for women to have to leave the refuge of home, to abandon its four walls, whether willingly or unwillingly. And finally, it's a way to think visually about the nuanced and often violent, gendered, entangled power relations of domesticity and the women whose lives are impacted on by those. Now, chapter three, Leaving Home, has as its centerpiece an installation of cozy fires. The ashes I collected from the reassuring fires I lit in the grate when I returned home from each visit to the sites of abandonment. On the walls are more postcards from the edge, quite abstract images exploring the destructive effects of fire, the burned ruined spaces left behind. The images frame a video projection entitled Lines of Flight, after Deleuze, which both celebrates and mourns the act of fleeing, soaring above the now erased home. So if you so choose, the abandoned home can be read, not just as an empty space, not just as crumbling walls, not just as a place you drive past unseen, but rather as an entanglement, as a site, as an archive, and as a highly complex text. As a text read in relation to written texts, to theory, the ruin is as compelling and as complex politically as it is philosophically. It's the past and the future enmeshed in the present. As I set out to make sense of reading in and through the ruin, my point of departure was Freud and his writings on loss, lack and the uncanny. Then I moved to the theories of place from Jantz and Raud, then on to Derrida with his focus on the archive and on hauntology, texts that facilitate a reading of the abandoned home as an archive that is both spectral and in denial about itself, a place that shelters itself from the memory it is forgetting. Then on to Deleuze and Guattari and ways of thinking about the subject in place, differently, about generative possibilities the generative possibilities of the encounter with exteriorities that allows for a crumbling of the fixity of identities and a becoming. Then, and this is where I am settled at present, onto the new materialist feminist writings of Bredotti and van der Tain, focused as these are on the fluxes of matter and mind, of body and spirit, and on the transversality of spatiotemporality disciplinarity and paradigms and the active formation of theory. So finally, the title of chapter four, The Return of the Repressed. That is a homage to Louise Bourgeois. The visual focus of the installation in the big schoolhouse gallery is on breakages and ruptures. In the center of it is an assemblage focused on complex memories. This is the only part of the exhibition in which I allude, however obliquely, to the complexities of my own childhood in a fraught domestic setting. At the very back end of the gallery is an evidence table containing trays in which are laid out some of the scores of ceramic shards that I disinterred in middens and that I found lying in the arid felt. Evidence of years and decades of breakages accompanied by the sounds of glass breaking and the jarring, scraping noise of it being swept up. Above it is a final video projection 
floating over the skeleton framework of destroyed houses, final leaving homes. 